All right, welcome to the Big Techs Podcast. Today, we are joined by Chris, Ike, and the world-famous Kyle DeFore. <laughs> world. My, my world only. <laughs> we appreciate you coming by, dude. Oh, well, thank really, you guys we, for having me, man. I appreciate it. We know you're in the middle of a—you just came off a four-day class here at the ranch in yep. Texas. You did uh, scope carbine and pistol. Yep. We had some boys down there training with you. Uh, Chris was actually in class with you this weekend. Did you do all four days? Yep. Phenomenal. Um, Got hits at 1,000 yards with 5.56 five, with 10 mile an hour left to right wind. <laughs> but remember, the internet says that's not possible. So I saw it, on the internet. M must be true. Yeah. <laughs> it's fantastic. Good shooting, Chris. Thanks. And you got a hat. Yeah. It yeah. was a good wind call. Crystal. I'm not going to lie to you. It was a good <laughs> wind call. Wind call. Perfect. <laughs> I call win for everybody. So, uh, no, he did great, man. He got a hat in the pistol, hat for hat for scoped carbines. A little, I told these guys, man, it, it's not easy. You know, uh, the hat test for scoped carbine is um, obviously you're depending on a wind call, and I'm the one calling wind out of a spotter. And it is that that 400 yard shot. I don't. We don't use anything bigger than a BC steel. So, mm. you know, you've only got 12 inches of gimme, and then. Um, swirling wind you know it's a good thing about the ranch is that we always get wind <laughs> yeah. so um i tell people all the time if you want to do scoped rifle that is the best place to do it by far uh, in my opinion in the united states and i go pretty much all over but anyway yeah he got hits at a thousand man it's funny because he he knocked out like seven and eight and then he's like turns around and he goes let's go to nine and a thousand i'm like all right well, <laughs> rock on and i'm right behind him so i can read his trace the whole time so anyway it worked out really good that's nice. fantastic. Good shooting, dude. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, very, very proud of you. Yeah, it was, it was good fun. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, uh, a little bit of side notes here. So if you're new to the podcast, make sure you're you're following, you're liking, you're subscribing to us on YouTube, uh, letting us know how we're doing on Apple iTunes. If you haven't joined the Big Tech's Ordnance Facebook group on Facebook, make sure you find the BTO Friends group and join there because sometimes you can even submit comments to upcoming shows. Uh, and if we pick your comment, you get a $10 gift card. So uh, we appreciate y'all listening, watching, tuning in, sharing, all that stuff. And without further ado, Kyle, dude, tell us about Kyle DeFore. Where'd you come from? Mm. And how'd you get into this industry? Uh, I was born in Alabama. Um, Came in the military, at, uh, enlisted at 17, tried to do that whole boot camp thing my senior year, but it didn't work out, so ended up having to wait till I graduated. Um, I came in with the sole, sole intention of, of trying to go to the SEAL teams, so um, came I was 18 by the time I, I got in the Navy. Uh, did boot camp in Orlando, Florida. Um, from there, went to Coronado. Um, so I was, I was in BUDS within six months of graduating high school. Oh, wow. Um, did that. Uh, went to, uh, did about 10 years total in the SEAL teams. Um, just shy of 10 years. And, um, you know, did did a little bit. I mean, I wouldn't really consider my career um, too extraordinary, I don't think, compared to some of my, my bros, you know what I mean? I got some guys, you know, like like my best friend, I mean, did 20 plus years, 15 deployments. I, did, I don't have anything close to that. So I did a little bit of time in the GWAT um, and then uh, decided to get out at, right at that 10 year mark because I kept extending, you know, uh, it was either re-enlist or get out because they're like, you know, you got you to make a decision, right? Fence, you're on the fence. So I just decided to get out because I kind of accomplished everything I wanted to do, and I, I never really wanted to do a be a lifer, so to speak. Um, of course, you know, hindsight, right? In life, I there's times I kick myself for getting out. Um, but, you know, it is you know, it was a decision I made at the time, you know, being 27, 28 years old or whatever. And um, the first job I, I did, uh, I kind of bounced around with some gov work that was very similar to what I was doing in the mill. And then um, Eric Prince had, um, he was at, we were at SEAL Team 8 at the same time in the mid-90s. He was an officer, of course. Um, he had started BW, uh, Blackwater. And, um, you know, his intent was to kind of um, have a place people could train that was, um, you know, very similar to like the ranch out here. I mean, um, 
you know, there was just not, it's hard for a lot of people nowadays, especially with social media. They can't remember back that far. There were not a lot of places for the military to train, you know, so he wanted a place that was kind of a one-stop shop. So you got some sniper ranges, you got some carbine ranges, you got some pistol ranges, you got some shoot houses. And, um, and from what I remember, and I don't, don't want to put words in his mouth, but uh, I think he, he kind of wanted to cater toward the East Coast SEAL teams a little bit because, uh, you know, Moyoc's only about an hour away. So um, my old training officer at SEAL Team 8 ended up being um, the director of training for Eric. And, um, and he kind of, I mean, it was not, I tell people this all the time, they never believe me, this was not a a path I took, I, like, you know, I'm going to be a pro shooter. Like, that was not how it happened. It happened that this guy um, named Jim, you know, he's like, hey, man, we need somebody to teach a, I, I can't even remember what it was. It might have been a pistol, it might have been a carbine, I don't know. And back then, it, there were not full-time employees at, at Blackwater. That was not a thing. It was like, you would do IC work, you know. Um, so you might teach a class, five-day carbine. You might not do anything for three months, you know, and you're doing whatever else you're doing. And that's how it started. Um, and then by probably by late 04, and again, uh, people have asked me before, because uh, the Blackwater thing comes up every once in a while, and I, I'm kind of amazed that nobody's written a book about the training piece of it yet. But it was either late 04, maybe spring 05. I can't really remember. Um, it was big enough that, like, at that point, you know, the head shed at B-Dub is like, all right, we need full-time people, right? So it was me and three other dudes, um, and they all nicknamed us the Four Horsemen because we were all wrestling fans of the 80s. And uh, <laughs> we were the first four time, uh, full four-time uh, instructors there. Um, and all three of those guys have gone on to do really, really good stuff. And um, so that's how it started. And um, did about four, almost five years at, at Blackwater. Uh, kind of, you know, within the next couple of years, I worked my way up to like I'm I'm the head instructor for all firearms and tactics. So had a bunch of really good dudes working for me, guys that are like in the industry now, super famous guys. Um, and I would tell people like, again, you know, job. It wasn't probably until a couple of years after doing that where I'm like, hmm. Maybe I could do this for a living, you know. Um, but again, nowadays with social media, you know, Instagram, Facebook didn't get big till probably 10, 11, somewhere in there. You know, before that, we all had a Google blog, which, again, most people are like, a what? Because <laughs> there was no way to get info out. And, um, you know, that's when so, – so, like, midway through that, I start kind of going, okay, this is not a bad gig. I mean, it's not like a real job, you know. I mean, like <laughs> – I mean, it's fun, you know, you're, you're shooting guns and training and doing that kind of stuff. So um, that's when it started. And probably halfway through that B-dub time, um, I got on a couple of TV shows for shooting. Obviously, that didn't hurt. Um, magazine articles, all that kind of stuff. Um, started developing shooting tests for military and government units, which made some, some pretty good, um, you know, I guess, quote unquote, fame, like people were like, hey, OK, that's kind of cool. And a lot of that stuff was just based on real world stuff, you know, what I thought people needed for accuracy and speed. So I did that um, up until 09. And then um, I think everybody's pr pretty well aware of the issues that, that B-Dub was having. I mean, it wasn't like anything crazy, but I kind of um, I think a lot of us saw the writing on the wall. You know, post uh, post Nasur Square over in Iraq, and you know, just uh, I, I think a, in my personal opinion. I think politically, a lot of people probably had it out for Eric a little bit, and and I mean, I didn't know him that well. I'll make sure that's crystal clear. I mean, you know, it's like he's the boss. You know, you don't really. I mean, I knew him a little bit, but not like best friends or anything. But I, that's just my opinion. Look in hindsight again on what's going on. So I was like, man, this is kind of looking like this place might go away, you know, kind of deal. And um, and th those years, man, I'll tell you, like a lot of people too, wait, we, as far as the shooting thing goes and like what you guys do here with supplying like, you know, guns and 
ammo and parts and accessories and like like that place was to say it was the mecca of the training world would be i think a big understatement i don't think most people realize nowadays that the stuff we did back then like i can trace different people's you know carbine operator back to the original carbine operator manuals that we wrote you know for a five-day class um and again, I, you know, I don't really care. I mean, I'm not trying to get credit for it or anything, but you know, it's kind of interesting when people, when I see stuff, I'm like, well, I know where that came from, <laughs> you know? Um, and at the same time, you know, one of the things we were doing and, and I wanted to make sure too, like it, this was not all me. Cause that's another problem that I think nowadays people are like, well, DeFore came up with that. And he can, I, di I didn't invent uh, the, the template for government contracting for shooting and tactics. There was probably 25 guys down there. I just happened to be in charge of most of them. But, I mean, that that was a big deal. So, like, a lot of guys nowadays, there's guys that are in the shooting industry right now. They've been in five, six, seven years. They don't understand that the pricing structure, you know, the statement of work, the deliverables. They We, we invented – that did not exist until us. We invented that, um, which is good. I mean, obviously, now it's easy. It's, it's, you know, copy and paste. So there's just a lot of dudes that deserve a lot of credit. Uh, from that era for that and um, you know regardless uh, a buddy of mine that um, he was a Delta officer um, he worked there as well he branched off to form his own company because I think he was kind of the same way like things are not looking good company could get sold that kind of thing um, he started a, a company called Tiger Swan uh, Tiger Swan was uh, based out of North Carolina Kind of the same thing, a uh, little bitty facility, not as big as Blackwater, obviously, but um, they kind of hired me. Hey, you want to come down here, be, our, be our, our head trainer or whatever? So went down there, was there for a year, um, and just um, in that year kind of decided, you know, with talking to the wife, like if I'm ever going to do my own thing, like now is probably a pretty good time. So because at that point, I've now I'm like a – you know, I'm like a quote unquote, I'm a paid shooter for a, a rifle company. I'm a paid shooter for a pistol company. Um, you know, like, let's do it kind of thing. And it just so happened that uh, I got a contract from the gov to, to do one certain thing. And, and that's when I, I put my two weeks in for at Tiger Swan and said, hey, I'm going to make a go of it. And we formed a business. And so, so this thing that I'm doing now has been going since 2010. So, wow. That's that's kind of it. I mean, nowadays, since 2010, you know, the majority of our stuff is uh, is all mill and gov. Um, you know, typically we're somewhere um, like I was telling you guys before the show. I'm somewhere between 1,800 and 2,000 students a year, both open enrollment and and gov mill. Uh, the open enrollment side's probably somewhere around 300, 350, uh, and then you know you're looking at like 1700 gov in some capacity pistol carbine scoped rifle ckb that's that's the big four so that's a that's the long-winded answer yeah that's, that's it that's good yeah that was great so that covered that covered a few decades right now i know man i've been doing <laughs> it for a minute right i um, trained you were actually my first open enrollment training class i took outside of like i mean like Travel to stay the night at legit training class back yeah. in back in like twenty twelve or whatever. And you said that was Kentucky, right? Yeah, where it was cold. I remember that class because it was cold. I mean, it was literally zero. Oh yeah. I think uh, we might have got up to like fifteen degrees or something on the oh, second wow. day. Yeah, that was epic, and it was, um, you know, funny enough. Like Kentucky, you talk to most people, like so there'll be people listening. Like, Kentucky gets cold. I'm like, man. Probably some of the coldest I've ever been is like North Carolina, Kentucky, you know, yeah. Virginia. <laughs> you know, people don't believe that, but yeah, that was a cold class. I remember it very clearly because um, I had on like an expedition uh, down suit because <laughs> I was like, well, I got to be able to demo. You know what I mean? <laughs> I got to be able to perform somewhat. But yeah, that was a good one, man. I remember that. It was fun. Fun class. It really started me into the. Um, I can. That was what got me into, you know what, I think I can host classes. That's, I think I can bring training into where I was in Missouri. That really got me out of just the just a shooter to being like, maybe I can do something into the industry yeah. after after I got out. 
and I appreciate you coming on the show, dude. Yeah, it's good, man. I've actually never been on like a podcast like this <laughs> where I can hear myself. It's usually me on my phone driving down the road. I did a podcast one time, you know, in my motorcycle helmet going down the interstate. <laughs> I was like, so this is like a new one for me. I haven't been on that many podcasts. I think I've been on like four, maybe. Well, we appreciate it. Yeah, we good. appreciate it. Good stuff. We uh, we have a pretty loyal following. Our audience is pretty big, and so we're trying to get really good content and not a commercial, dude. I mean, like that was the that was yeah. the goal of this. Was like we get like I was saying earlier. You know, we get to talk to some cool people in the industry on a weekly basis. So why not share that experience with our our listeners and our viewers? If we had to mention every product in your warehouse, we would be here for a minute. I, I would need to. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. I think people, yeah, I don't think, yeah, that's funny. We hear that sometimes on podcasts, though, right? Yeah, we definitely do. Uh, so in, so you brought up a, a bunch of stuff I want to touch on in your in your bio. And, and one of the first things I want to talk about is how did you develop your, your instruction techniques? Because I've been to a bunch of classes, and each instructor has their own individual techniques, but yours stand out over a lot of techniques. Yeah, I appreciate that, man. That's a big compliment. Um, here's the God's honest truth. People have asked me that before, not on a podcast, but like you know, other other shooter instructor people. Um, that time at Blackwater, I can't, I can't tell you how, how important that was because, again, in 2022, right now, you know, September of 2022, like the majority of people listening to this, they don't really know what we were doing. But just to put it in context, it was not unusual for us to run 600 to 700 students a week through that place in its wow. prime. I mean. That's mind boggling. It's it's it really is. And that's why that's why I say like I, I, I find it to me it, like in the shooting and I know that shooting in itself, professional shooting, whether you're a comp guy or you're, you know, like a tactical dude or whatever your your label for yourself is, I know it's not you know, we, we are not that big of a thing, right? If you compare us to the motorcycle industry or the surfing industry or whatever, we're we're kind of a tiny thing. But I'm still like mind boggled that somebody hasn't written a book on that. But you just look at the numbers um, that we're putting through. So, so, I mean, that's the answer is like, I did not know what I was doing. I mean, I'll tell you straight up, man. All I did was what was taught to me when I was in the military. Um, but what ended up happening when you run that many numbers through. So, the, so typically the way it would work just to, so everybody can, can kind of concept this. Um, I'm in charge of all these instructors at B-Dub, right? That's all we do. We don't deploy overseas. We're not part of that part of Blackwater. We're, we're just there at Moyoc, just training. Okay, so say I got, at any time, between 15 and 25 people working for me. It would be like me, Chris, and Ike are going to do a five-day carbine this week. And then the next week, we might have a five-day carbine again. We might have a five-day pistol. And... This Chris, you're off that this week. We're working, you're off. And the way that, that we set it up as a team is that like we made it so you, you're you're just on your own. You show up at eight, you shoot till four, do whatever the hell you want. We don't care. But we, we came up with a list of things like you, you have to be you know, back then of course IDPA was kinda like everybody had to be a master class IDPA, right? Everybody had to be master class stock production for USPSA. Um, you had to, at a minimum, you had to do at least the the, the, the classifiers. Uh, we had certain standards like the Hackathorn. We, we liked that because we felt like as a 60-round shooting test, that was probably a, a better, and you got to remember there's no red dots back then. It's all irons. So the, you had to shoot 275 or better with four different pistols at any time. Like if somebody showed up and said, hey, man, here's a Glock 17, go. Here's a Beretta 92F, go. Here's a SIG 226 or a 228 or 229, go. Um, here's an H&K USP, go, because those were the four pistols that were the most common for military and government contracting for, for the client. 
So, like, you didn't have we, – we didn't really put up with that whole, well, I can't shoot that well kind of thing. You, you know what I'm saying? Like, that was just not a deal because you got a week off to perfect your craft, right? So the shooting aspect of it was not hard. Another thing that we did down there is you got your own vehicle hmm. on property. You know, you're looking at – that place is like a 10,000-acre yeah. facility. Uh, asking a guy to, to drive his personal vehicle around there was, you know, we need that liability-wise out. <laughs> create a problem later so we had these old junkers you know whether it was a van most most of the instructors liked a van believe it or not they liked a you know like a minivan oh yeah because you could open the door up we'd remove the seats and like your individual car is it's got every kind of target that was made back then in these little storage shelves and 50 cal ammo cans are permanently in your vehicle one is full of nine mil one's full of five five six we give you every gun. You don't have to buy your own, which is like, think about that. And if you were a sniper, like I was a sniper in the mill, so I had a 700. I had a five, a Mark 12. I had a, a 301 Mag, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so, you know, how do I develop that technique? I can screw up so many times on 500, 700 students a week that, you know, it's not going to take a genius very long to go, okay, those guys really didn't get that much better. You know, you know what I mean? You're like, uh, maybe I'm doing something wrong. So that was one thing, just gross numbers. Um, another thing was, I've told this story before. I might have told it to you guys in Pistol. Ernest Langdon was either still active duty in the Marine Corps, or he had maybe just gotten out. I don't know. We'd, we'd have to ask him. But he, uh, his crew had come down that he was training, and it was like this uh, – and I, don't quote me on this. I think he was doing like this personal protection kind of a bodyguard thing in the Marine Corps for certain people. He was like the, like the gunny in charge of it kind of thing. And I remember those guys came down for a five day pistol. And like on Monday afternoon, I was like, I am not that good. <laughs> I was like, fuck, you know. Um, oh shit, can we cuss on here? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. Right. yeah. Say whatever you want. Um, and I remember thinking. That's Ernest Langdon's boys. You know what I mean? One of those deals. And that was like around the time, too. Like, Ernest, I think, had, um, I don't know. Again, we'd have to ask him or, or put the Google foo in, into action. But, you know, Ernest beat Rob Latham for, like, the National World Championship one of those years, shooting like a bone stock 226 or something. Maybe an X5. But, like, I mean, something ridiculous, like a DASA gun. Yeah. You know, and everybody, again, pre-internet, so it was only, like, you know, if, if he did that right now, Instagram would lose its, you know, it'd be like, holy shit, look at this, right? So I remember, like, I knew who Ernest was, and I was like, okay, I need to get better, right? So, again, I'm seeing so much stuff, do you know what I mean? That's not SEAL team related as far as training. So between the numbers and between people coming there that were better than me at that time, for sure, I'm like, hey, man, maybe I should get on this horse, you know. And, 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 again, it didn't take too terribly long because it's like we gave you everything to do down there. That was It was simple. It was easy. So that was kind of like that's how I developed the technique. And, obviously, since 2010, I get direct feedback, you know. And even at B-Dub and Tiger Swan, we're training guys who were deploying during the GWAT. Obviously, I'm still doing that. I mean, there's no real GWAT anymore, but, but guys that are still deployable type people – you know, they'll come back and they'll be like, um, everybody wants to hear the, the wins, but there's also a lot of loses. Like, they'll come back and go, hey, Kyle, the way we were doing this, like, it really didn't apply. We just did a four-month deployment. We did a lot of hits. Useless. I'm like, all right. Have no ego in it. I'm like, well, we're not going to do that anymore. At the same time, they'll say, hey, the way this is what we're seeing, you know. Like, I'll tell you a new one, or not a new one. I'll tell you one back then, even at B-Dub, that, that we hit right away. This is so simple for everybody. But again, nowadays in 2022, you, there's 25 people on Instagram that do this. Like standing 50-yard shots with a carbine and holding yourself to a degree of accuracy. And I'm talking about like like inside the A zone of USPSA target with, with half-second splits. Half-second to, to .75, but well under a one-second split. If you told somebody that pre-9-11, they'd be like, well, you know. That's not, it would have been like this crazy, remember that whole like put the mag under, you know, like oh, yeah. some, some crazy shit, right? So that was like stuff we get back and, and, and now you're developing the, that piece, right? So that's kind of how that has been crafted over the years, you know? Fantastic. Could you move your mic just a little bit away from your face? Perfect. 
getting a little scratching from the beard. Uh, the beard, yeah. Um, Chris, do you have any questions before I jump into another one? Or Ike, do you have any questions before I jump into another one? No, nah, man, I'm good. I want to talk about the standards, like your fa- your famous hat quals. Uh, what's the – everyone's probably pretty familiar with the pistol, but what about the scope carving and the, the different ones that you do? What's – and h- how did you develop those standards and um, – I mean, that sort of thing. Oh, man. That might be our hour right there. <laughs> All right. So, I mean, I don't care. I'm not on a timeline. Okay. So, the hat qual things, um, you know, they've been changed recently, like as in basically the yeah, last think- month, right? I, I added to it. So, a couple things on that. Um, you know, once I was introduced to the bullseye, again, back, that that kind of was in, in the SEAL team days. We were still doing that. Um. I just, at, at BW, we started messing around with, like, do we really need, and again, for, for some of the listeners, just so you're tracking, that stuff was based on 10 rounds and 10 minutes slow fire from 25, right? A CMP type, NRA, NRA CMP type competition, which I used to do that as well. Um, and along the way, I started thinking, man, like, you know, you look at the score, data return, right? Okay, this is what I score. This is what I score. This is what I score. And, you know, one day I was just like, I mean, what if I shoot it, like, not 10 rounds into what if I shoot 10 rounds in five minutes? You know, I, well, look, same score, you know, one point off, two points off, right? And and just keep working it down. I'm like, well, I really don't need 10 minutes. If I take 10 minutes, I'm still going to shoot a 93. And um, it took me 10 minutes. Like, I could have been doing something else, right? And so over time, I figured this out um, to the point where – and I've told people this before, and I, I definitely would not mention names here, but, like, there's a couple guys in the industry who were like, well, you're not going to be able to do that, like, you know, 10 rounds in 20 seconds. Like, there's no way, you know, like kind of thing. And I'm thinking, well, I do it all the time. I mean, like, I have figured out a way with my grip and my trigger and, and the way I'm looking at sights to, to do it. And I told this guy, I was like, you know, I, you know, it can't be done or you can't teach it. Which one is it? You know, there's a big difference there, right? And so that's kind of how that developed. Um, and, of course, right as I got done with that, I did one for carbine. Um, and the purpose of, of all those was if we're looking at that magical kind of, quote, unquote, far distance, 100 yards for carbine, 25 for pistol. And, and it, you know, if I had to do it now, it might be a little bit different for carbine because the LPVO is so prevalent. And But, you know, back then, iron sights is a, still a lot of things, especially for LE guys, and maybe a red dot, unmagnified. So those things were like very, I I realized this is a very quick way that I can tell if a guy understands real fundamentals of fast and accurate shooting combined. Because his positioning, his mounting of the gun, his grip of the pistol, or how he's mounting a carbine, it, it it cannot be compromised. Like in, you know, 14 seconds for, for the rifle and then, and then 20 for irons with the, with the pistol. Uh, also, he's going to understand recoil control. He's going to understand resetting on recoil. He's going under, to, he, he's going to, in some capacity, have to know how to track his sights in recoil, no matter if he's using an iron, a dot, or or a reticle. So that's kind of how that came about. Um, which is funny because, like, it's not like something I don't hang my hat on, but like nobody shot bullseyes fast before me. Like I'm the I'm the guy. Nowadays, and then that's why the test had to change because you can't swing a dead cat now <laughs> on Instagram without hitting somebody who's like shooting a bull fast. So literally in the past few years, you know, when I started this almost, I guess, 10 plus years ago, the, the speed shooting of for accuracy, you might give one hat away a class, maybe two. I mean, dude, like last year, I mean, I'm out of hats, bro. <laughs> like, I mean, literally we can't make enough. Like it's a 14 man class and I'm giving away eight. 10, 12. So I'm like, okay. So the shooting industry has kind of caught up now. Everybody's getting it. And especially when the red dot came in, because obviously it's it's way easier with a red dot. How much easier? 25%, right? That's why a red dot time at 25 yards with the bull is, is 15 seconds instead of 20. So um, so that's how that kind of came in. Uh, the scoped one was because the prevalence of 556 five, both both army and navy side in 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 socom for the war that was that was the number one for most of the scope guys i mean yes we carried uh, bigger rifles at some point but like the the quote unquote mark 12 or or some kind of variant of that was the most famous 
So when we look at it, and like this would be a thing Christian can tell you because he just came off of a scope class, like a 5.56 five, rifle past 400, I mean, you're getting into, I mean, if I give you an E-type silhouette, yes. Okay, not, but but I, again, I know what kill zone is on a man. Um, you're going to have to have a wind call at 400. You can pull off three without a wind call for typically, but you're going to have to have one at 400. And, and, you know, the ability of that shooter to do that out of his own scope, it is possible. It takes a little, obviously, some time. So the scoped one is uh, standing to prone. You have a, a BC steel at 100, 200, 300, and 400. And I try to make it not crazy angles, uh, you, know, you know, nothing crazy. Like we wouldn't want one at like, you know, left side berm, right side berm. So you're like, you know, because – and the point is to do that all in holds, right, um, with a Horus-type reticle or, or some type of, you know, reticle that's famous now for that. So you drop in the prone, um, one round at 100, one round at 2, one round at 3, one round at 4. No dial. You can dial. I tell guys in open enrollment, you can dial if you want. Military guys, no dial, hold only, and um, no makeup shots. One shot on each, hmm. sub twenty seconds. Um, again, people are like, "Well, that sounds easy." And I mean, it is easy if you're in a tunnel and there's no <laughs> wind. You know what I mean? And I told these guys in the class, like we, uh, the scope rifle I did before this. One guy, uh, it was so funny. I was running all fourteen through it, timing each guy individually. The winds wind. I mean, I'm a ten to fifteen, bro. So we're holding like mil, mil and a half at at four hundred when it's gusting to fifteen. And then this guy gets up there. The wind completely stops. He drops. And he doesn't like twelve five. <laughs> you know, I think I did it in like fifteen or something. And and you know, he he gets up. And he's like, well, that wasn't hard. And I'm like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> I'm like, war gods were looking down on you, my friend. Like you know, but um, so some of those tests like um. The pistol specifically, there was a unit that asked me to do something. They're like, hey, man, 60-round shooting test. Like, we're deploying. We ain't got time for that kind of stuff, right? They're like, can you come up with something quick, like whatever? If you look at all my shooting tests online, and they're all on the website, um, they were all developed for specific units by request for certain things. Um, and, and I'll tell you, man, if a guy can pull off that bullseye thing with a pistol, I mean— He's he's at more than 50% there as far as being a complete pistol shooter, you know. But, of course, I added a draw stroke, a low ready, and a build drill now just because can't make that many hats, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, it's good to me. Hey, listen, in two years from now, if if the shooting public is like, again, we're having the majority of the class. Pa- okay, well, I've got, I'm not going to run out of shit. i got more shit to do that I can add to it, change it. But that's kind of how that developed. Nice. So you think the driver of the shooting standards being changed, all right, so is the fact that more people have better skill and technology, or is it just, where do you think that? Well, that the te- it's definitely a technology thing, because I'll tell you, one of the things, um, and, and if people don't admit this, they're lying to you, but there's there's a ton of dudes out there that, that that shoot really well at a very high level with a red dot and you take that red dot off and go to iron sights and it's going to look like a shotgun um that's one of the reasons i bounce back and forth all the time i don't i don't dedicate to one or the other i just constantly go dot irons dot irons dot iron because you're going to run into people and there's still military units that don't have dots there's still le units that don't have dots on the pistol and you know i i think if you're a quote unquote a pro and you show up to a civilian class and everybody has irons and you've got your red dot to me that is not i would not even consider that that's not a thing you know you damn sure can't do that on a gov contract <laughs> <laughs> you know you might you might have a contracting officer show up out there which doesn't happen often they don't usually come to the range they do they did they did during covid <laughs> it's like the first time i ever saw one but um you know usually you're talking to them on the phone or whatever but um yeah, technology is definitely a thing. I mean, that red dot thing, too, you know, I would say one of the other things that you see if you do this a lot is a lot of people a lot of people will use that dot to mask some of the errors in their fundamentals, right? And a lot of people don't admit to that. But, but again, if you put an iron sight gun in their hand and they can't come close to that same performance, you know it's true. So, um, yeah, I mean, d- definitely technology helps. I mean, but w- whatever, that's fine. Uh, you still got to go and do some speed stuff at seven on a reduced. I don't use a whole A zone. I use half of it, so it's a six inch by six inch target. Um, you know, 
again, another another trick of the trade, which any any good pistol shooter is going to – like anybody that's got the experience – you know, a red dot guy keeping up. If you've got a guy like, uh, I don't know, name somebody that shoots a pistol good. Uh, who? Let's give me somebody. Who's a good pistol shooter? Blowers. Blowers. You know, you give Blowers a red dot at seven yards and you put his times in there and then you send him on iron sight. I guarantee his iron sight's going to be faster because he's a good shooter. And he, you know, the, it's at the end of the gun, right? We don't have to wait to find that window. I mean... I would say, like, look at somebody like another one I would bring up, um, you know, any any of the grandmasters or the masters in USPSA that have done both time on dot and iron. I've talked to a bunch of and they're like, look, dude, like I'm going to burn it down. It's, it's, you know, inside seven yards with irons <laughs> like I mean, it's a joke. Right. Whereas the dot could be I, and when I say slower, zero, five, one, zero, something along those lines. Um and, you know, you see that in open enrollment classes with guys who, quote, unquote, can't find the dot, right? Things like that, which never happens with iron sights, right? So, um, yeah, I mean, there's definitely some um, some things there that, you know, maybe maybe we just let loose some industry secrets. I don't know. <laughs> that's why I bounce back and forth, man. I don't want to get caught in my pants now, you know? You've been a proponent of the, you know, it's not the arrow, or it's not the arrow, it's the Indian, Right. All, yeah, all day. For, for a whole long time. Yeah. I mean, as as long as I've been following you, it's been one of the things where you swap, you know, you're you're shooting a stock Glock with it's just got your sights on it. Yeah. You know, or a staccato now. Yeah. You know, it doesn't have a dot on it. Or we won't talk about what we saw this morning, but uh, <laughs> uh, it's secret but, shit. Right. Right. But and or you're running a carbine with a spark, a vortex spark yeah. on it, like. That's that's not saying anything bad about a spark, but that's pretty. Yeah, dude. I re- hey, remember a few years ago, I did almost two years with a Glock forty three X bone stock, and I still made every time, every standard. And I mean, it was so long ago now that people are like, "Did he really do that?" They're like scrolling back through three thousand posts trying to find it, and it's like. Um, but but to me, here's the thing, like when people like that, I don't know, like my wife's friends ask me what I do for a living. If I say I'm a professional shooter, you should be a professional shooter. Professional shooter is not I shoot only a red dot on a comped gun with not with barely power factor ammo. To me, that you're a professional pistol shooter for that. You see what with I'm saying? Pistol. Yeah, with, with right with your, you know, like um, which again, it, it, hidden from most media type things in this industry, is you got to understand the guys who are doing the heavy lifting on the gov contracting side. You're not going to you know whoever uh, you know the unit the, the gov unit that has iron an iron sighted um, Glock 19. You're not going to show up there with your. <laughs> ported and comped gun you know they're gonna be like you got to remember dude again statement of work right they're gonna, you have to perform and show these drills with a with our gun you know so uh i mean me personally i take that seriously that's why because guys ask me all the time they're like hey man you're shooting your your uh 11 and a half inch with a red dot but then in this class you're shooting a freaking 16 inch with a one to 10 and i'm like well the reason I, you know, here's the reason why, because like I just left a gov contract and, and they have red dots, unmagnified and shorties. That's why I'm shooting that, you know, and I'm not going to pack three guns to travel on the road with. So, um, I don't know, to me, that's always been a thing. And, and there's a lot of, there's a ton of dudes in this industry. You could put a freaking rubber band gun in their hand and they're going to be able to perform, you know, but there's also a ton of dudes that like. If it's not 75 degrees, partly sunny, you know, and everything's perfect, it's a it's a freaking nightmare. So, but I don't I don't think as a as a consumer, do whatever you want. I mean, whatever, I don't care. But I I that's I can't teach I the way that my job lifestyle has been set up. I just don't have the the luxury of doing that. I have to be able to basically pick up anything and go big. So. So, favorite carry gun? 
Do you have one? The one I'm wearing right now. Yeah. That we can't talk that we about. Can't talk about. Okay. <laughs> I mean, this thing is. I'm telling you, you're not going to be able to keep them in stock once it releases. It is. It, 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 they crushed it, dude. They fucking crushed it. I mean, I it, like. It's one of those deals where it's like. I'll probably, I mean, I have to keep a Glock, obviously, for the gov contracting shit. I have to have a couple of different Glocks, one with, an, with a red dot and one with irons. Um, but other than that, everything else is going away. It, it's that good. It's ridiculous. I mean, it's like, I mean, Christian saw it, you know. Mm-hmm. I mean, I was uh, did 50 yards, uh, AC zone. You know, may, may, I think I had maybe maybe six C zone hits at 50 on um again somewhere around 0.75 splits um i thought you had fewer than that it might have i don't know i took a picture of it you know uh 25 yards um dude i pulled off a 12 second 92 <laughs> irons with this thing shooting 115 grains whatever the hell i mean this thing is ridiculous i mean yes it is the indian a little bit i mean i'm not i'm not telling you that if you're going to buy this gun you're going to be able to do that but <laughs> um Guaranteed, Cal. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I get sued into oblivion, but man, I like it. It is nice. It is really nice. That's that's my, that's my favorite. Now, obviously, we we can't talk about that. But uh, what else? I mean, Glock 19 is fine. Uh, hey, a C2 is great. I love a C2. Um, this is the better version of that. You know, I don't even know what the hell the name of it's going to be. <laughs> that's cool. So. Um, I mean, I think, too, like, uh, you know, some guys, you know, 43X, that's their thing, right? Because the way they dress or where they work. It's like, okay, whatever, man. Get good with it. Yeah. You know, it's not, it's not you're going to have to put a lot more reps into it. Your grip better be balls the fuck on every time. Um, what I don't like is I don't like guys, and and you see this a lot, like, like dudes show up to a class, they're wearing a freaking Glock 17 with an X300, and I know why they have an X300 on it to help with recoil control, right? It's not like they're a, you know, some type of ninja SWAT guy or whatever, you know. And then they've got they're shooting on, you know, power factor ammo barely, you know, and then a red dot on it, and then I'm like, okay. Let's go to the bar and drink some beer after class, right? And they show up wearing a Glock 43X with iron sights. I'm like, what's up with that? Well, I can't really hide that other one. Not really. I'm like, well, why the fuck are you carrying it? But again, like, if that's your, I mean, hey, listen, if you just want to shoot and shoot and whatever, that's fine. But, like, don't go tell some undercover cop that he should be carrying a fucking full frame with a, a light and a fucking red <laughs> dot. You know what I mean? Because obviously he can't. He's got to hide that damn thing, right? So um, I hate to see that, right? That's stuff I don't like. But unless unless a guy's just, I mean, we get tons of guys. I I get guys in my class all the time, just comp guys. They got their comp rig on, you know? Mm. And it's like they're doing their thing, right? I mean, to the point where they're like, hey, man, I'm just going to, you know, do you mind when we're, when we're doing shooting on the mover barricades, I'm going to rep out some, you know, stage shit. I'm like, I don't give a shit. That's your, that's your game, right? Whatever. Do your thing. But but on the high side of that, that's what I don't like to see when guys are comparing themselves to a, a dude who still does this for a living. I mean, I'm a has been at this point, but like, there's still guys out there like, you know, you talk to some of these UC guys in a big city, and they're like, uh, yeah, dude, you're not carrying a red dot. Like, like that's the thing. Like again, like how many guys know that red dots shine through in low light? Like if you're in a bar. I mean, unless you turn it down, right? Or unless you're wearing a thick black shirt. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, a lot of guys don't see that. And and the times Frank Wendell, uh, the Northman, you know, he passed last year. He had multiple pictures of dudes, like, in restaurants and bars. He would just snap the picture of their red dot shining through. It was hilarious. I'm like, yeah, you're a real concealed carry guy. You got that red dot dial all the way up, which, you know, probably you should, or at least maybe one or two down. But, like, right now, like, it, you look like a... <laughs> some type of cartoon like some you know like there's a red dot floating around in your gut right now like That's what awesome. the hell you know well, it's something that most people never think about yeah, right? yeah. talk about a tell yeah <laughs> shit and we're back and we're back thank you for that break I was just totally ad living that. I don't even know what I'm doing. <laughs> don't worry, we don't either. We're just kind of we're just kind of doing this live as yeah, well. Kind of making it up as we go. Right, right. Joe Rogan does piss breaks, so we should do. We did one too, right? Yeah. <laughs> I don't think he edits it though. 
Yeah, he just goes. <laughs> There's like some dude on there like, I got to piss. <laughs> like a six-pack into it. <laughs> it was like, We're Carrie. not drinking here, though, by the way. Yeah. We're, we're sober. We're drinking water. Kerry Davis last week, he was talking about how he went to uh, – he was doing a class for like 900 officers, like a like a, a briefing in an auditorium, and left his mic on when he went to the the bathroom break. Oh, classy! <laughs> yeah, and so he's like, ah. He's like, like yeah. farting like an <laughs> yeah. old man. Yeah. But luckily, his buddy was in the in the sound booth and he turned it off. You ever seen that dude's feet? Carries? Yeah. No. He's got like so. a size 11 and a half foot. What? I swear to God, I'm not lying to you. He wears a size 11. But he's like five five or some yeah, shit. Yeah, I'm gonna have to go back and look. On I the mean, video. it's fucking weird, dude. <laughs> <laughs> um, here's one thing on on Dark Angel Medical. Like at a certain point, you know, it, it, people should not be like, I can't find a med kit. I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? Like, like literally, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you, small, medium, large. Uh, you know, uh, what do you want? I mean, yeah. like, I, I, that's kind of some things like. One thing about the shooting type persona, you know, some guys are technologically like they can't they can't wrap their mind around they have a computer in their pocket. Yeah, you, you know what I mean. Like it's twenty twenty two. You should not be asking me about a med kit. Like literally, Google med kit tactical. I mean, Jesus Christ, Dark Angel. You could, as a matter of fact, you can't even make a bad decision. You could go on his website and just be like, I don't know. I'll pick this one. Yeah. I mean, you're fine. You're good. You know what I'm saying? Like that shit cracks me up. But yeah, he's got really big feet. <laughs> and he's really short. He's probably going to fight. He'll text me right after this. He'll be like, thanks, dick. That's awesome. If he was a chick, he would be really good at b- balance beam, right? That's one thing in gymnastics. My daughter did, did competitive gymnastics forever. They want the the girls on the beam if they got longer feet. I mean, it's easier for them, yeah, right? Because they're on a four-inch beam doing all that crazy shit. So, But he's not a girl, and he doesn't do, do gymnastics. So <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> We're definitely not editing that out. That's yeah. awesome. That's, that's, that's That'll be dope. the first text I get after here. That's that's awesome. That's the uh, that's what the people want. Yeah, right? that's what, that's what <laughs> the people want. They want the, they want the background stories. Speaking of, you got any funny stories? Let's. You got any funny stories of, of training over the last couple decades? Couple decades, yeah. Oh Jesus. Um, well, there's always the. Um, so obviously guys like me and other my contemporaries we're flying with guns all over the country, right? Which is not a big deal, you know. I mean, you get used to it. You you know what airports are like. I mean, you fly out of like Norfolk, Virginia, they don't I mean, it's <laughs> like every other dude's flying with his shit. It's like easy, okay. You fly out of like San Francisco International, they see one gun every 6 months or whatever, you know. Um so, but sometimes, like, it's interesting that, you know, the airlines will tell you they don't flag the gun case. I mean, they do. Oh. It, it is flagged. It's not, you know, they, they try to pull it off, but it is obviously th- they're tracking that, right? The guns never get lost, the gun box, like ever. Like, I've never had one in almost 20 years of doing this where I've, like, show. But I have had my suitcase get lost, right? So you show up to a class, <laughs> and basically the way I'm dressed right now, flip-flops and fucking board shorts. And you're like, all right, well, here we go. Here we go. And sometimes, like, I I put like holsters in checked luggage. Sometimes, um, you know, like plate carrier checked luggage. So I'm standing there in board shorts and flip flops, no ear pro. So I'm using foamies, which I hate. And I'm like, hey, dude, uh, let me borrow your gun real quick. You know, here's the demo. <laughs> I'm like, take your holster every time I'm for the draw. I'm gonna need you to take your holster off for about ten minutes. Let me, and then now you can have it back. Like that's been a funny one. That's happened before. Um, I've had, um, I did have a gun case one time get rerouted the wrong way. Oh shit! And this was an interesting thing. This is a Frank Wendell story because we're sitting on the Northman's back patio in Bangor, Maine. And he had this great round table, and we called it the round, you know, Knights of the Round Table kind of thing. And TSA had called me and said, hey, man, we have your gun case, but it's here. Like, and it was at an airport that I did not route through. So somehow this thing goes. So I say guns never get lost, but in that, I mean, it wasn't lost. It just got routed the wrong way. And I'm like, uh, well, I need that, like, tomorrow morning at 8. You know, and they're like, yeah, not happening. You know what I mean? Like, Bangor, Maine, it'll be there. It might be there tomorrow, you know, kind of deal. 
I end up talking to um, the TSA agent, and I total mindset type thing. I'm just kind of I'm feeding him, and like I'm I'm, and I'm like, hey, bro, like, because he's like, we need the combo because like we're gonna have to re rescreen this because we're you know it didn't even come from here. Is this total odd thing, right? And I'm thinking, give the combo like what? Because I was at the time I was using a military padlock. Which, you know, TSA has the keys for, like, the normal shit, right? This is why I ended up going. Now I use TSA-approved locks. Back then, I didn't. And um, I'm like, oh, God. And they're like, look, dude, we're going to have to cut the lock if you don't give it to us. And then it's like, it's not going to come because, like, I'm not going to buy two locks for you. You know, one of those <laughs> deals. And I'm like, oh, God. So I'm like, hey, bro, like, how do I know you, you're who you are? How do I know somebody didn't go to the airport, pick up my case, you're calling me because my number's on the side of the box, yeah. and you're pretending to be a TS. And he goes, all right, well, I'll FaceTime you. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> so we're we're drinking beer on the back of the Northlands patio. This dude FaceTimes me. It's a TSA guy. Like, he's he's there at the TSA say like, and he's like, hey, how you doing? And <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, oh, that's cool, you know. Like, what if so I give him the combo, he opens up. He goes, look, man, I'm putting it in. It's all good. I'm locking it back. And, and by this point, we've become like friends, you know. <laughs> And he goes, hey, man, I'm going to do what I can to get this to Bangor tomorrow. Like, you know, like, hey, the first flight out, you know, Bangor's not an easy place to go to, like two or three flights a day or whatever. And uh, he ends up getting the box to Bangor at noon. So I only had to demo for like half a day with, with other people's shit. And um, I kept in touch with that dude for like a couple of years. Like I'd text him every once in a while. Hey, any crazy gun shit going on? You know, he's laughing. It's like, <laughs> dude, whenever you come by here, let's go eat lunch, you know, whatever. <laughs> So funny stuff like that. Um, I had a fire in Southern California. I've had that three times oh, wow. around Los Angeles area, you know, especially back a few years ago when they had that real big drought, kind of similar to what's going on now, where, um, you know, the rain owner comes out and he's like, hey, um, yeah, we're done. You know, it's like one o'clock, you know, first day. I'm like, uh. Well, we can't be done because I'm not. I'm not done. He's like, yeah. Well, in about ten minutes, there's going to be a whatever it is, seven thirty-seven, seven forty-seven, when that drops that orange fire return stuff. He's like, it's coming over. Like we're leaving. Like I, you don't don't want to be here, kind of deal. That was kind of funny. So I ended up taking the entire class to the parking lot that was right on the on, on the on the main drag. We just parked our cars on the side, did mindset brief. <laughs> That's, I mean, it's all I could do. Yeah, I couldn't do anything else. else. It's Start, a good brief. It's started good brief. doing combatives. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like people driving by. They're like, why are these guys hitting pads out here? Like, it's <laughs> kind of weird, right? So we had a couple of California State guys with us, so it wasn't a big deal. But, I mean, I've had some funny things like that happen. Um, I had a dude one time. This is hilarious. Um, this is North Carolina doing a class. You know. I do 14 students per class. That's kind of, again, one of the things we kind of developed over the years. We're like, hey, if you bump it to 16 or 18 as a singleton, it gets a little weird. 14, manageable, 12 to 14, somewhere in there, right? I mean, that's just my opinion. Um, so I've got 13 students. I'm like, well, where's that 14th guy? Right? 805. Taxi cab shows up on the range. Now, this range is in the middle. Of, it was the old range, uh, the guys that have trained with like Kyle Lamb and People like that. It was that old range we used to use outside of, um, I think it's near Dunn. It's outside of outside of Fayetteville, a few miles. Taxi cab pulls up. Dude gets out of the taxi cab with nothing. And he comes up and he goes, hey, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm in the class. I'm like, uh, okay. I'm like, well, where's your, where's your gun? He's like, well, I don't have one. I'm like, uh, okay. He goes, well, I thought I, you know, you, you, you provided it. I'm like, I'm, I would assume then you don't. My, my powers of perception are telling me you don't have ammo either, right? <laughs> He's like, no, no ammo. I'm like, okay. I guess you can shoot my stuff. I'm going to need a demo every once in a while, but, like, you know, go big. Every day, dude would call a cab, get back in a cab, go back home. Next day, shows up in a cab. It's the strangest shit I ever saw. <laughs> and, a, and a student, the funny thing is, a good buddy of mine that was in the class, um, he's actually uh, one of the Streamlight guys. He took a picture of this, and like every, I don't know, it's like every two years he'll text me the picture of the dude getting out of the cab because he's like, that's the strangest shit I've ever seen in my life, man. So, I mean, I've definitely seen some weird things in classes. Um, I've had a military crew where we're training, and um, their little 
you know, at, at the time they were they were using um, beepers instead of instead of iPhones. And I mean, it's like nine thirty, like on a Monday, and they're like, "We're done." I'm like, "What do you mean we're done?" They're like, "We got to go. We got shit going on." I'm like, "All right, so I I, I get it. You know, whatever." And tomorrow eight. They're like, "No," <laughs> like, "We'll call you." And just it, that's it, Dunsky. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm like, and then like two months later, you hear from the from the dude who set up the training. He's like, "Yeah, we had to go do a thing. You know, uh, no big deal." Hey, can you come back this week? You know, kind of deal. So I've had that happen before. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's if I think about it, there's all kinds of weirdnesses. I mean, nothing. I mean, I don't know. Nothing. I, I, I to me, not at this point, I've probably seen it all. You know. Um, like I was telling you, a couple of Hollywood actors show up. That's always a funny one because it's always – never right away. It's always like a couple hours into it, people are like, God, that guy looks familiar, you know. But everybody's got hat and sunnies and ear pro on, so it's kind of like they're hidden, you know. And then by finally it'll be like, hey, you know, like that's so-and-so, you know, like no shit, right? You know, that's kind of funny. I had an actor one time for a two-day – and at the end of the class, you know, sometimes people are like, hey, can we get a picture with you or whatever? And I'm like, oh, whatever. I don't know why you want a picture of me, but okay, you know. And the dude, he comes up and he's like, there were more people that wanted a picture of you than me. He goes, that's <laughs> really kind of fucking with my ego right now. You know what I mean? And I'm like, hey, listen, I don't, you know, I don't know. Maybe this one proof that we're here. I don't know. I don't think they're going to be putting it on their, on their wall or anything. <laughs> but, so, yeah, some funny stuff. So what have you got going on in in the future? So I know you're doing, you, you said earlier, like 40, 42 mil classes a year. Ish, yeah. And then how many how many open enrollments? This year was like 30, 32. Um, and, and next year is pretty, pretty stacked as well. I think now, I think I'm only at 24 next year. But we always end up adding because it'll be stuff like I'll get a gov job wherever uh, you know what i'm saying yeah i try to make it where it's a little bit regional for the travel to be a little bit like like i'm in texas for two weeks right it's like why would why would i go back home come back to texas come back you know it just doesn't make sense um so i try to do that so sometimes you know you end up getting a gov job later in the year there are definitely particular units in the mill uh and the federal uh you know kind of area where <laughs> they're bad about scheduling as in like can you come here next week? You know, one of those deals. And you're like, um, well, no, because <laughs> I'm in New York. You know, they're like in California or whatever. Or, you know, S but some of those guys I try to um, appease, you know, and, and, and it's really it's not so much their fault. It's just the way their work is is kind of laid out. So that's where, like, if people see a class and we always announce on social, if, if I, you know, I'll be like, hey, I'm going to be in X these two days and, and, and that's also why you see a lot of like we saw here in texas while i'm out here at the ranch you saw a class that was a monday tuesday mm -hmm. you know you're like what the hell because i mean obviously in the civilian aspect the weekend class is the is kind of the norm because you know people don't have to take time off etc but sometimes i just throw that out there because i'm like well i'm gonna be in you know the san diego area for this amount of time um why not throw open enrollment? And, and with, with ones like that, I don't. If they don't sell out, I don't really care. You're I mean, there, you're I mean, out. they typically always sell out. But you know, I'm there anyway. And it's like, what am I going to be doing on Saturday and Sunday? Drinking beer, watching some stupid TV show in the hotel room? Because you know, you can only PT for so much a day, right? You know, you like, what am I doing? Might as well go train some people, yeah. right? Make some money. Um, so, so that happens. That's kind of like the, the flow of that. If, if people wonder why it's like. There's definitely the set courses for open enrollment, the places that I'll always go, and then there's the ones that pop up just because a gov job has popped up maybe in the same area. That's so. cool. Is there anything on development-wise? Are you are you planning on adding anything to your curriculum as in like, so you've got scope carbine, mm -hmm. you've got standard carbine? Yep. Pistol? Yep. You Pistol one and two, right? No, I don't really do a one or two. two. I just kind of read the class. Um Cause you know, there's like, I, I mean, I don't know. The I've never been a fan of like having a pistol one two, carbine one two. Cause the the a good thing about me is I really don't draw a demographic that you know. Pretty much, I can get everybody on the same sheet within a couple hours. So, 
Just it's just pistol. It's just carbine, scoped carbine. Um, I mean, I'm probably not gonna really add anything. I'm not a real big fan of like, y you know, I don't like you know people ask all the time let's do some cqb i'm like eh, i mean you know it's not there's no such thing as one man cqb this is not a this does not exist i mean um you know you have two military units whose selection is based off of cqb and neither one of them tell you that one man cqb is a thing it's like you know there's barricade work which we do anyway <laughs> you know so i'm not a real big fan of that i don't know what even if you had a facility i mean I don't I don't think that I would not feel good as an instructor about like I don't think the product when you leave there is going to be that good. Yeah. I mean you're you're repping this out with three people you're never going to see again the rest of your life probably. Yeah. Um you have no foundation in the safety and the the theory and understanding that. I mean I, this is something I wouldn't do and I'm not I'm not bashing people who do it. I mean whatever, do your thing. Um I mean who am I to say? But but that's just me personally. I'm not gonna do stuff like that i do a little nods and laser open enrollment because um honestly that started from basically guys hog hunting at night <laughs> you know, like, um and back then i was doing some some of that myself down in central florida and south georgia so you know i don't think that's too terrible i mean it's just shooting you know you just happen to be doing it with nods and laser none, none of that's illegal so um i do that but now the open enrollment side kind of kind of steady as she goes with that as far as like you know nothing nothing crazy chris or i y'all do you have any questions specifically we're we're at over an hour here so i don't want to beat a dead horse but there's ton, this dude's got a ton of information <laughs> yeah no, I, I, <laughs> like you know i mean you go uh, like i said i am not time is not a thing for me i've got plenty of time to get to where i'm going so um as i tell the Q and A at the end of a class, like now's the time because yeah. I, you know what I mean. <laughs> and by the way, this is way better than doing those phone call things. Oh, oh yeah. Because <laughs> you know you can't hear, they can't hear me. We lose service, yada yada. I mean, not that those are bad, but it's just it's the you know I work a lot, so I don't have a a lot of these. This doesn't happen a lot, so we we really wanted to when we started the podcast here. Uh, this this was it, you know. Like we we have the the ability to do remote stuff. But we want it face to face, man. We want to share that experience with our our viewers and our listeners of what we get to do, you know. Like I, I emailed you out of the blue. I was like, "Hey, Kyle, I'm Chris. <laughs> I'm from Big Techs. I took your class in 2012. Can you come by and do a podcast?" You're like, "Uh, okay." <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, know. so it, it's pretty cool that you came by, and uh, I definitely want to share that knowledge. I think one one of the things that you told me that stuck with me. I mean, a, a decade. A decade later is you're like uh, I was I was sitting there drinking coffee with you on like Saturday morning before class or maybe Sunday morning so day two it's cold as shit I was like hey man you know I'm I'm in the military I don't get to do this a lot I'm you know I was a drill sergeant at the time like my weekends were like fucking gold you yeah know, like I was like I don't have a lot of money I'm, I'm training w what do I do and you're like and let me I'm gonna quote you as good as I can you're like look dude you're like, look, there's a lot of people that are really good with a rifle that fucking suck with a pistol. But you don't find people that are really good with a pistol that suck as with a rifle. Yeah. I was like. Fact. Fucking, yeah. That makes sense. So, like, my whole attitude changed when I was to train. It was like, you know, like, I'm getting out. I'm not going to be carrying a rifle every day anymore. Pistol translates. Yep. So this this is what I'm going to do is I'm going to go pistol class, pistol class, pistol class. I'm going to shoot competition. I'm going to shoot, you know, I'm going to be shooting dot drills every every week. I'm going to go out and shoot bullseyes every week. This is what I'm going to do. I wish I could do it still. Yeah. But at, at that time, that's what I, I shifted. And you're, you're talking a decade later. I'm still, all right, dude, this is, this is it. You know, like if you're really good at shooting a pistol, probably going to be pretty okay with a rifle when it comes down to it yeah you know what's interesting about that is like do you know why pistols are harder to shoot because you never get the right answer when you ask most i was people. gonna say I, I can come up with probably about half a dozen yeah i was gonna say because <laughs> it's smaller and the sight radius is bullshit like it's just like just nah, that's nothing no that's not it so listen here's the deal 
if you look at it, uh, you guys carry rifles, carbines here, right? If they're bone stock, nothing on them. How much does a carbine weigh? Like weight wise, what does it weigh? Seven, seven eight pounds. pounds. Seven eight pounds, right? If it's a a mil spec or you know le oem trigger, what's the trigger pull weight? Seven pounds. Yeah. It, you know, if you measure it with a no shit trigger weight, because here's the one thing. This is like the one inch group thing with shooting rifle. Mm -hmm. You know, people are like, I got a one inch gun. I'm like, actually, it's one and a quarter. But, you know, they, I mean, if you actually measure it. And so if you actually <laughs> measure it, most of your carbines are going to pull somewhere between five and a half, six and a half pounds. Right. An OEM, like a, like a gov type thing. So think about that. You're pulling less than the weight of the gun to make it go off. Which means that, you know, the ultimate answer in shooting is don't move the gun when you pull the trigger. Sounds very simple, but that's the ultimate answer. Okay, now let's go to a normal pistol that the audience can all relate to, Glock 17. How much does it weigh? A couple pounds. A couple pounds. Two and a half pounds, right? What's the trigger pull weight? Seven. Seven, but eight. Five and a half. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, you get typically maybe five and a half on yeah. a, you know, so you're pulling twice the weight of the gun to make it go off. Now, that's a truism. You can't get away from that. that and that's one reason pistols are harder to shoot, because you're pulling more than the weight of the gun to make the gun go off. Now, a lot of people would hear that and they go, well, I got, I got a solution. <laughs> if I've got a two and a half pound pistol, I'll just get a two and a half pound trigger pull. Should be gold. <laughs> like, well, you know, okay, now we're getting into some... You know, now you see why in a in an open comp thing like the guns are the way they are, um, because those guys they're so good at what they do and they understand this that that's what they're trying to pull off, right? Um, I would never suggest that a guy that's carrying one concealed like on the street ever do that. Like uh, <laughs> to me, four pounds is like the absolute minimum on a pistol, and even that to me, I would not do that personally, but. Um, that's the reason pistols are harder to shoot. One of the biggest reasons, right? So, yeah, I mean, we used to say, and this is even in the nineties in the military, it's like, Hey, how do you get good at pistol? Shoot pistol. How do you get good at carbine? Shoot more pistol. You know what I mean? And, and I'll tell you like an interesting thing, like I see on social right now, um, Ben Steger, I think that's how you say his name. Steger or Steger? Like a multi-time champion type yeah, dude, yeah. right? I don't know the guy from, I mean, I've like texted him one time about something, but, um, I noticed that he's shooting carbine now, like on his, like, cause his feed pops up on my stuff, right? It is not going to take that dude long to get good at carbine because he, he knows what he can get away with sighting wise mm -hmm. and trigger pull wise. Um, whereas if you went the other way, now I can't name a carbine dude, like a carbine only guy. I don't know. I just don't have the, the knowledge. I'm sure there's somebody out there. You put a, a pistol in his hand and it, you are not going to get the as fast a result the same way. It's not going to happen. Right. So like what I would, if I had a bunch of time, here's what I'd love to do. This is a great experiment. Um, you guys do the, um, like the swag for Scott Jedlinski. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He only shoots pistol. That's all he does. I mean, he's like the red dot guy, right? Yeah. I would like to do an experiment where I take him with a rifle I'll bet you in sub five days I can get that guy to where like it it'd be a joke. There's no way in fuck you can do that the other way around. There's no way. Because mm -hmm. he under again, he understands it's so hard to shoot a pistol fast and accurate and like do the things that a lot of these guys are doing. It's just such an easy turnaround on rifle. Um but but the the bad aspect about that, like in some of the training world, is that like I'll get a unit, uh, particularly a LE unit, will call up and go, hey, we want to do five day carbine, and you know when I do a five day, we'll do a little bit of vehicle stuff in there, obviously, because you know we'll do it's it's really a, a a complete thing, obviously combatives, you know the whole the whole mix, and I'm like my first question is why, you know though I swear to God multiple times because it's fun, that's the answer, <laughs> and I'm like. Yeah, but you carry a pistol. Like, like we should probably be repping that out. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, <laughs> it's just interesting that a lot of people don't know that that dynamic. Um, but yeah, it's it's for sure a thing. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. 
Yeah, I know when I started out, I was like, yeah, a rifle's fucking cool. Oh, yeah, it's fun. Do this <laughs> Go and take first class, and I'm like, oh, I suck with a handgun. I should shoot this more. Shoot handgun more, shoot handgun more. Go back to shooting rifle. I'm like, oh, I'm still pretty good with this. I ain't worried about that shit yeah, anymore. It's, it, yeah, I'm telling you, it's a... You know, I try and take like 12 classes a year. Probably take like one or two rifles a year. Everything else is handgun. Yeah. So... You're welcome for cracking the code. Yeah, there, there's there cheat, cheat code. Cheat code. Shoot more pistol to get good pistol. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's it's a thing, man. Um, yeah. So one of the things that you, you always do in class uh, is your mindset brief. Yeah. Right? Do you want to touch on that a little bit here? Sure. Um, most important aspect of training, in my opinion, um, based on the small amount of real world experiences I have, um, based on the people I've trained, you know, um, you know, I'm very lucky in the aspect of one thing that like, there are not many of us in the industry. And I mean, like when I say not many, like really there's two, um, that have been direct contracted to train a crew that's going to do something. And I mean, like, like you're brought in, obviously, as a civilian, you're not told what's happening, but you kind of get the feel, <laughs> you know, especially if you've trained that unit before and you're like, this feels different. Like everybody's acting different that, you know, they're like, hey, man, we got to get solid zeros. You know, we got to, you know, blah, blah. And I'm like, God, before, you know, normally they're just like, whatever, let's knock the Z out and let's get going, you know, kind of, you know, and, and that has happened to me more than once. Um so that mindset thing, and, and I told the, you know, for Christian here, it's like he's hearing this, he's heard it twice in the past week, which I feel bad. Um, I did not in, invent that. That's another thing like uh, TV show wise, you know, we put it on a TV show, I think back in 2010, because at that point with social media getting started, uh, Tom Kyer from, from Syoc Kali was like, you know, we, we should get it labeled because what, what was happening is people were taking like one thing that we were saying. They didn't really understand the way we were saying it. And we saw them putting it out and it was all it was all fucked up. Right. So I kind of did like a little five minute spill on a TV show one time. But um, I mean, there are so many guys that like I am a I am a spoke and a wheel of that thing. It's just that I think because of the number of people I train, I get a lot more credit than I probably deserve on it. But, um, you know, I would tell you like Tom Kyer, the SIOC guys, Harley Elmore from Headhunter Blades, uh, or Warriors Way, Texas, up here in Wichita Falls, uh, Bill Rapier, Amtac. You know, Bill, Bill Rapier, we, we could do an entire podcast on him. I mean, 20 years in the mill, um, about 16 in our unit. Um, you, you know, those are guys who have modeled – and molded this mindset brief. I mean, yeah, I had a little, little bit in it, but like you got to figure I leave in Oh four bill stays until 2014. So like there's 10 years where I'm not doing a damn thing. Well, bill is so like he can bring those things back. And, and another thing about like that whole mindset thing is like, I don't even get introduced to the Syoc guys, even through the military without JD Patinsky from Northern Red. So, which is th that, that right, th we could do a podcast on that. JD and Tom were training together before JD was ever in the army. A lot of people don't know that. Um, so like, there's a ton of people. And then the big crew, like I, I always write down when I do it, I'm like, Hey, here's some people you might want to check out. Right. You know, the Atienza brothers, you know, uh, Carl Bong and D. Um, you know, sometimes you can train with these guys. Sometimes you got the SIOC guys are really heavy military. I mean, they rarely have time for an open enrollment class. Bill, uh, Amtac shooting, he does tons of stuff. There's plenty, plenty of chances to get in with those guys. But like, you got to understand that the the crux of this are those active duty guys, both the law enforcement side and the military side. Those are the dudes. I mean, because like a lot of us, man, we're we're has beens, never was, right? We're we haven't been doing this job for a while. I mean, ob obviously, I've got some experiences I can base on, but when I have the guys come back and go, "Hey, man, this part is what we should work on," the, you know, that kind of thing. So, to me, it it I tell these guys all the time, 
the shooting and the fighting, uh, you know, uh, we do a little bit of jujitsu type stuff, a little bit of, you know, Kali uh, with the blade, but the, the mindset piece is it. I mean, um, to the point where I know, like, y- you know, one of the things I've, I've sa- said recently is like, <laughs> there's a thing that was going around for a while where people are like, you don't need, you don't need mindset. Just do something hard. I'm like, okay, but you understand that in itself is a mindset, right? I mean, it's like if if you actually take the ego away from that, like, so it's like not having a mindset is a mindset. <laughs> so, it's, and again, the 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 brief. I mean, we couldn't really do it right here unless we have a couple hours. But um, the thing is, is that people have it. All we're doing is giving you a template for it. Do you know what I mean? We're giving you a template to try to work through it. And, and our, our formula will work for that. That problem could be you want to run an ultra marathon. That problem could be you want to overcome a catastrophic injury. That problem could be you want to go through a selection course for whatever. Um, so I think a lot of people get confused because they're not hearing this from the horse's mouth or one of the horses that I just mentioned. And they see a small piece written, and they they have a lot of conjecture of what we're talking about. Because I've I've met people, and they're like, yeah, man, feeder versus receiver. You know what that means? You know, blah, blah. And I'm like, that is absolutely not what it means. Like, not even close. Like, that's not what I put out in class. That's not what Tom puts out in class. Like, that's not it. You've seen it written. You've kind of came up with your own definition, third, fourth, fifth hand. And... And now you're you're telling the world that this is what it is, and that's not what it is. So I, one of the things on that, when we do that, it is not a war story time. Like I'm, if you co- if you're coming to my class to hear a war story, first off, I don't really have any. I probably was a mediocre seal at best, would be my guess. I don't know, but like I, me telling you a war story, what are you going to learn? I don't. I I mean, it's entertainment. It's entertainment is what I would call it. It's not even a thing. I, I tell people all the time, check this out. The, there's a bunch of us who have sent guys to buds. We have sent guys to rasp, to, to ranger selection. You know, like a friend of a friend. Like, hey, this is my buddy, he wants to go there. It's whatever. I'm like, hey, can you go shoot with him? That's always the thing. My, 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 my kid's going to go to buds. Can you shoot with him? I'm like, look, that is the last thing. <laughs> like, the, like the, the SEAL teams will take care of that, I promise you. He don't need that. Here's what he needs. And and I, I, I this may sound egotistical, but I'm, I'm telling you 100%. We are like undefeated there. I mean, like twenty and zero. When we get them on the right mindset path, it, they pass. You know, um, whereas there's a couple of dudes where I'm, you know, super studs, right? Physically, like, like I mean, way better than than I ever was for sure, and like. You know, you you try to you try to tell them this, like, hey man, we should really talk about a formula for working through a problem, a mindset brief, right? Um, oh yeah, I'll get to it. Yeah, 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 you know, hey, my run, I'm I'm running five minute miles now. You know, I'm like, well, we that's cool. We should really get to the, you know, and they don't do it, and then it's failure time, you know. So, um, yeah, to me, uh, I mean, there's been multiple problems in my life that I've used that template for. Um, but I tell people all the time, if you're going to some conference and some guy that was in the GWAT is going to get up there and, and run his suck about like, oh, we were pinned down by fire and, you know, we didn't quit. What did you learn from that? I mean, you didn't learn anything. But like this thing is like foolproof. There's no war story to it. It's like, look, here, A, B, C, D, here you go. Apply that to your problem. And it I, it it can't not work. I mean, it's like we have we've we've kind of fine-tuned it to that point right um so yeah that's something we're pretty you know tribe wise we're pretty proud of um but again i want to if i'm on a podcast i want to make sure people i am not (laughs) if if the if there was a wheel and kyle is a part of it you know like the part that the spoke goes into that attaches (laughs) to the rim i'm like that do you know what i mean yeah like bill rapier's like the fucking hub you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like Tom Kyer is the bearing. Do you, you know what I'm saying? Like, I, so I, I tell people too. One of the things I, I I make sure I put out. I've been putting this out for probably a year now. We're in the golden age of training. It's not going to get better. I mean, just logically, just think about that. 
you just ended a 20 year war. Mm -hmm. Um, the chances of us ever having a 20 year war again are probably zero in our lifetimes because of the perception of the American public and politicians and leaders. They're not, it's just not going to be something that's going to happen because of, of the epic failure of the withdrawal of Af Afghanistan. So now, right now, you have dudes the world over, like, like Bill, like, um, you know, uh, some of these other, some of these other cats, um, you know, some of these CAG guys that are out, that are out training. Um, these guys were going out every night. Like, like a lot of people, I, I'm telling you, people do not understand this. They weren't on a four month deployment and they did one hit. <laughs> that is not how that party works. Every night. It's not like, hey, if we're going to get shot at tonight. I mean, th they are doing it every. How can you possibly replicate those lessons? It's impossible. No, absolutely. And, and we're already at a point. I, I, I told these guys a couple of examples of when I train the military now, because your senior leadership now were not even new guys in the GWAT. They came in at the tail end of it and didn't even see the high op tempo. So there's little things they don't even know. This always cracks me up about the military because at, at the beginning of 9-11, I swear to God, we looked up SEAL Team 1 and SEAL Team 2, lessons learned from Vietnam, and we checked every fucking one of them again at the beginning of the GY, which is mind-boggling to me. I'm like, why did we do that? They fucking wrote it down for us. But we're, I don't know. It's just in law enforcement, it's the same way. They never, I don't know, it should be like on a fucking thumb drive and being constantly looped. But we, you know, just inserting to target, things like that. We relearned all those lessons. You're going to do the same thing again. But, man, I would like to have a, if you could give me a template <laughs> and the problem, hey, we're getting blown out of the fucking sky on insert, whatever, you know, because we're fast roping on top of the building. Well, look, here's the template for it. Go through it. All your answers are right there. You know what I'm saying? So um, I, I, to me, like, I would rather train mindset than anything. Because that'll, that'll also kind of alleviate, you know, years ago, one of the articles that's still on my website, I told people, you need to prioritize what you're doing. You know, a cop, what does a cop need to do? You ask a cop, they need to be good at pistol. I'm like, eh, it probably needs to be number two or number three. What does a cop do every, every time he, he, he is in vicinity of any kind of suspect? First thing he's going to do, hands on, right? He's touching people. In fact, a cop is going to touch people probably every day in some capacity. His number one priority needs to be combatives, period, end. Pistol, maybe maybe number two or three, you know. I would even put in there at this point, like, like his awareness level, which is part of the mindset template, it, it probably needs to be a certain way because he can, he can work himself out of certain problems without ever drawing the gun, right, mm -hmm. if he knows how, right? Um, now, you look at a military guy. Again, look at guys like me or where I came from. Number one priority, you would say rifle, right? I, I would say tactics. And that is, that's number one. Rifle's number two. Pistol doesn't even need to be on the fucking list. You know, if you're the li top list of five, I would, pistol's not even there. I would go tactics. I would go rifle next. I would go insert and extract <laughs> and then combatives. That's what I would do for, for a, a SOCOM type dude, so, something along those lines. But people don't want to do that because... They have emotional attachments to things they're good at. Mm -hmm. And by the way, that's in the mindset template. <laughs> and if you go through there, it'll say, don't do emotional, could do logic, right? Again, it's not a war story. It's not, and it, it's proven to work itself over, you know, um, I mean, if anybody ever wanted like legit, like we can, we could name things that would blow your mind that I can tell you hundred percent that is success because of a mindset brief. Yeah, they're good at their job, but they're good at their job because of their mindset. And they pulled this job off because of their mindset, et cetera. So, yeah, I mean, we, uh, I'll, I'll never not do it in class with the exception of like sometimes like scoped rifle. We got so much shit going on. We don't do combatives in scoped rifle, um, you know, because we're calling wind. We're, we're reading trace. We, you got a lot of shit going on. Just setting up the guns takes most guys an hour plus because they're, they're not right out of the gate. But most, every carbine class, every pistol class, you're getting a mindset brief, um, which I'm looking forward to. 
in the next week because when I'm with Harley Elmore up in Wichita Falls, Harley doesn't know this yet, but he's going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I probably need to text him that. But um, and you know, I'm being selfish there. I want him to do it because I want to be I want to be a student. You know, I get to run my mouth all the time, and that's fine. But like, it's great when you can get around some of these other dudes and like hear them talk or the way they put it out. You know, Bill and I, and I tell these guys this, and, and Bill worked for me. When, when Bill got out of, out of the military, he, he worked for me for a little bit because, he, you know, he's like, hey, uh, again, look at that. He has no ego in the game, even though that guy has a thousand times more experiences than me. He's like, I don't know what I'm doing. As a pro, if I'm going to be a pro shooter, I don't know. You've been doing this for a while. Let, you know, let me let me burn a couple of reps with you. I'm like, sure. And with and I knew he was going to go start his own company. I don't give a shit. But like, Bill, it, it, I don't know how he does the mindset brief. I don't care. I know it's going to be correct. But you know, we've had students. Obviously, we share the same student kind of demographic. And and Bill, you know, students are like, well, you you do it different than Bill. And I'm like, well, don't tell me how because I don't want to be influenced by that. And, and, and me and Bill have talked, and we know we do it a little bit different. Obviously, the end state and the formula and the template is still the same. But So I think it like golden age of training, I think guys need to get in there and, and definitely get some experiences from these guys. That's going to be – it's going to – this is going to be a lost art pretty soon, man. We're not getting younger, right? <laughs> so. Definitely not. Excellent. Got any got – any? Got anything that was brought up at class this weekend? It's usually a lot of, like, gear questions and stuff like that. Like, I know you probably, like, every class, like, especially this weekend when it rained and stuff like that, like, dudes are like, oh, what do I need gear-wise? Like, yeah. you know, rain jacket, rain pants, shoes, you know, shit like that. People are always bringing that up. Yeah, um, gear's a big one. I mean, um, you know... Probably, I would say, two of your things uh, on these open enrollment classes, gear and weather, are probably a couple things that never really get uh, the the audience that they need. Um, now, here, our first day of pistol was, was epic. I mean, it was 94, <laughs> 95, yeah. true temp. Um, two heat cas on them? We had two heat casualties. I mean, um, you know, we had a guy quit. He just, he just left. Um, here, here's what I tell people. Like, if you go on my website right now, I, I know most of the classes are sold out. But if you go on there and just just pick one, just click on it, it, it literally says, "Look, man, like, have food and water. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, have be prepared for weather conditions." Right? I even put a blurb in there about pistol because when it rains hard, you know, like the majority of guys are concealed, right? In open enrollment class. If it rains really hard. How are you going to safely pull off concealed draws wearing Gore-Tex pants and a Gore-Tex over jacket? And people are like, well, I'll do it all the time. And I'm like, okay, l listen, like, first off, like, think about that. You, you do it all the time. I'm on the range. Like, this year is going to be one of my first years where I'm not 300 days. I'm going to be like 287, 288. Uh, for the listeners, do your own math. Mo most people in the U.S., and I'm not trying to brag. I'm just telling you, it's more of like a, it's the job. You're like a you're like a farmer. You're like a rancher. You know, you're out in the middle of nowhere. Do it's what it is. Most people only work maybe if they work a lot. It's 225 days a year, maybe. So like when I tell you that I'm in weather all the time, like I'm in weather all the time. I mean, it's either shitty hot or shitty cold. It, it's like <laughs> rarely, unless you work Los Angeles the whole time or San Diego. It's just the way it is. And, like, you're not going to pull off these concealed draws safely. You know, the drawstring, the fucking, all this bullshit. Your clothing just gets stuck on top of the holster. If you're shooting a striker-fired pistol and you get a T-shirt stuck in your trigger guard and you push down, which way are you pushing the trigger, right? And you see guys and they're like, well, and, and I'll, dude, I'm telling you straight up, I'll just be like, you can't shoot, bro. Either Either get wet, don't wear anything, just wear your normal clothes and shoot safely, or you're going to have to tell them, just get overbelt. From Big Tex Outdoors, buy an <laughs> overbuilt and a drop leg holster. You know, like, there's your Sorry. advertisement, right? There we go. Um, but like, who cares that you're not caring to doing your concealed draw because it's raining its ass off anyway? So like, it's you know, uh, at least you can do it safely if you've got like a cop type rig thing going on, right? So that's a big thing on gear. Um, a lot of people would say, well, if it's raining that hard, you should stop training. Well, that's not happening. 
because you paid 750 bucks to come to class. Yeah. Like, we ain't stopping. Now, I will. What I did with these guys is I rearranged the curriculum mm -hmm. to account for the heat, and we got rained on the second day. So I, I rearranged the curriculum. Now, that's probably more on me. Like, it drives me crazy because I like to do a logical progression of training. Mm -hmm. Now, some of the students are probably going to be like, eh, I don't really, I don't know, whatever. We did combatives here instead of there. We did the draw here. You know, but, like, to me it matters. Um, but at a certain point, dude, like, we've got to shoot. It's a shooting class. So if it rains for 48 hours, well, listen, man. We're shooting steel, and we're shooting in the rain. All I'm going to do is back it up so that the steel target, BC Steel, is the size of a of the upper A zone at 7. You know, we can do that at 25 yards, right? It's just the same thing. It's just a different target that doesn't melt in the rain. But if I can't, if you can't do that, you just you wasted 750 bucks. which, again, mind-boggling to me that a lot of these people will be like, well, I'm not spending 800 bucks on a Gore-Tex suit. I'm like, okay. The first time... <laughs> <laughs> that you're in a 48-hour downpour, which, by the way, I did that in College Station here in Texas about seven years ago. It rained. I flew into Austin. It rained from the time I landed Friday night until I flew out Monday morning. It never stopped raining. We ran the entire class on steel. And dudes, same thing. Four guys quit. They're just like, I'm, I'm done. I'm like, I told you what to buy. You know? <laughs> They're like, well, I'm not spending 800 bucks on, on an Arc'teryx Gore-Tex suit. Fuck that. I'm like, okay, well, then don't. You know, I guess only train when it's sunny. Yeah. But I mean, like, the whole, I can't afford it. I'm like, dude, don't drink beer for six months. Don't go out to dinner. Uh, you know, fucking whatever. You can afford it if you want to. You can afford it, you know. And by the way, that $800 Gore-Tex suit's a one-time buy. It's, it lasts it's, the rest it's, of your yeah, life, it's, it's dude. Not, unless not you, like, anywhere. catch it on fire or some crazy shit, right? So um, that's, that's an important one. Um, you know, the cold, I mean. Yeah. Uh, the stu if there's anybody listening to this that was in the South Carolina class last year, was it last year? It was either last year or the year before. can't remember. Again, two people quit. Now, look, check this out. We know it's going to rain. Like, I mean, again, you have a computer in your pocket, bro. <laughs> Just look it up. Hey, it's going to rain during the class. All right, well. Um, our high for both days, I believe we never busted 30 degrees. Oh, wow. Now, a lot of people would be like, well, if it's 30 degrees below freezing, it wouldn't be rain. Well, it just happened to be humidity was high enough that it there was no snow, there was no ice. It was rain. 30 degrees in rain. There's a guy that trains me a lot. Uh, probably, I don't know if I can say his name. So I'm not, he's a former Marine, hard dude, great guy. You know, He's the one who got me kind of um, noticing, you know, saying and watches. Oh, yeah. He uh, He's like day one, he looks at me, he goes, I have my Arc'teryx Gore-Tex suit. I'm like, that's good. <laughs> and he goes, I have a down jacket and down pants to go underneath. And I'm like, that's good. Because we had a dude day one who shows up. He is wearing blue jeans. Oh, jeez. Boat shoes <laughs> with cotton socks, by the way, and a sweatshirt. Like, I don't even own those three things because <laughs> I can't use them in the hotter cold. Like, I literally don't have a cotton sweatshirt. I think I have one cotton sweatshirt that Pepper gave me that's, like, for walking around the house, right? I'm like, hey, bro. Is, do you have oh, – I'm good. I'm from Minnesota. <laughs> and I'm like um, – because I get people travel from all over. I'll get people in a Florida class, and half of them are from freaking, you know, Wyoming. It's just the way – because, uh, you know, I can only be so many places at once. I'm like, hey, I, that's fine. You're from Minnesota. But, like – I and I and, and listen, they are hard as fuck, like people from the north. They'll wear a T-shirt in 40-degree weather, right, whereas I'm like two down jackets into it because I'm a beach kid. But I'm like, there's no way. You're not going to be 16 hours in this. Like, it's not going to happen. He quit first day. I mean, he's like, dude, it is raining and 30 degrees to a point where his hands are so, he has no gloves. His hands were like that, not that red, but like that pink kind of, and I'm like, hey, man, can you feel the trigger? And he's like, well, you know, I just kind of put it in there and go. You know, one of those deals. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I think I think you might want to, you know, I gave him what I had, which was not, I didn't have a lot of extra stuff, but like, I would tell people, man, to spend a little research. You can't go wrong with any of the climbing gear, right? You know, the Ar Arcteryx, Black Diamond, Patagonia. These places, I mean, they've been making stuff for these guys that um, for years, right? Um, you know, we like the climbing stuff because with Electronic Ear Pro, kind of like what we're wearing now, like it, the hood will go over. 
You know, if you wear a baseball cap, here's another little tip for the listeners. Baseball cap, hood over the top, and you cinch it down, your eye pro will never get wet in the rain. You know? You'll see guys out there, no baseball cap, and they wear a hood, and the oh, water's yeah. coming straight down their face. And it's like, you know, so um, I'm a huge fan of Prometheus Design Works. Just because they're down is like, I don't know what he does. He makes a deal with the devil to make his down jackets that warm, but he has the thinnest, warmest jackets on the planet. But, you know, the problem with that is that his stuff is so popular, it sells out super fast. But, like, that's what I wear as a, as a warm layer. And then, like, the hard shells are like the climbing companies. So um, tell um, tell your listeners, man, do you guys know who Mark Twight is? You guys ever heard that name? I don't Not think so. You should Google Mark Twight. So if I tell you this, you'll be like, oh, that guy. You've heard of Jim Jones? The, 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 you know, as in G Y M, Jim Jones. Obviously, it's a play on the guy from, from Guyana who, <laughs> okay. you know, made, yeah. made everybody drink purple Kool Aid. Yeah. So he started that back in the day, um, you know, kind of a famous gym for working out. He trained all the guys for like, uh, you know, all these, um, the, the superhero movies like, uh, Superman, like Henry Cavill. He trained him. Uh, Gal Gadot, I think I'm saying that name correctly. You know the Wonder Woman, Aquaman. Yeah. He, he's tra- he 300. Remember 300? Yeah. Oh yeah. He trained all those dudes to look like that. That's not CGI. They go and spend like <laughs> six months with him, working out and eating. Okay, so Twite, uh, very famous alpinist, like back in the day, 80s, 90s, like as in like he pulled some routes that are like epic, right? And I bring him up because most of everything nowadays. He was the guy that SOCOM contracted to say, hey, these guys are cold in Afghanistan. Like, <laughs> you know, that that stupid fleece, whatever the hell we had, and a, and a fucking shitty rain show, that ain't cutting it, right? These guys are literally at, at 10, 12, 15 grand. They're freezing. He came up with that seven-layer system through Patagonia, you know, because he worked for them at the time, um, called the PCU. Yep. And if you look at that, that, that's kind of like I was talking to you earlier about the whole Blackwater thing and coming up with the carbine manuals and the pistol manuals and the, the flow of training, which everybody does now. They might not even know why they do it. You have a lot of companies now making gear that it's all based back on that stuff, right? Th- we need this for a base layer. We need this for a mid layer, you know, yada, yada, yada. That's a dude like a lot of people should probably give a Google to because between working out and, like, what to wear – um, you can't go wrong. Matter of fact, I'll give you another one. This just popped in my head. You guys know Sitka? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Do you guys carry that? No. No. So Sitka, like hunting gear wise, I mean, yeah, uh, dude, like, yeah. <laughs> so me and my kid went hunting this past, uh, winter in Wisconsin. We went whitetail hunting. Uh, a buddy of mine named John the Butcher. He's a butcher. Um, <laughs> he lives up there in the middle of nowhere. Um, Invited us up to his property. Dude, like, day one, it's minus 10. <laughs> okay, so I'm kind of like, okay, it's been a while since I've burned this rep, you know. So Sitka has a guy working for them named John Barklow. You guys ever heard that name? Some, like, some of them. Yeah, because he's, he's, he's out there, right? He's, and, and I've actually told him this via text. Um, so, you like, everybody right now on your Instagram machine – you should look up John Barclow. And once you find it, you'll be like, okay, this is the guy. So John Barclow was like, uh, I guess the best way to describe it is a survival instructor for the military. Like, that's what he did for 20 years. I mean, like, now think about that. It happened to be the 20 years that yeah. were in the war. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay? Sitka hired him when he retired. I swear to God, if you go onto John Barclow's website, I, I'm not lying to you. Pick something. Um... Bear hunting in Alaska. Let's just throw that out there. He has a list for you. <laughs> if you type it in, bear hunting, Alaska, it literally says this is the outer layer you need. This, I mean, it's that, it is that simple. Um, yeah, running a marathon in Arizona in July, you know, I mean, I don't know if he's got that. I mean, it's stupid proof, though. So it's like at a certain point, again, that technology thing, I don't have any, I'm not feeling sorry for you. You know what I mean? It's like, dude, it's 2022. The info is free and it's out there. I just gave you two great names of people that you couldn't, you could go to the moon and they could tell you what to wear. You know what I mean? So. Phenomenal. Anybody got it? 
anything else. Well, no, we, got, we got him. That was great. Said, you want to touch a little bit on blades and stuff for people? Yeah, blades. I mean, blades are cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, once again, I would I would tell you that the blade thing, um, it's not lost on me that I you know I know I was the first guy to get into it. We actually have a name for it for what I do and for for, for what like Bill Rapier does. And and for the most part, the Psyoc Tactical Group as well, we we call it integrated combatives because we're it's not just blade only. It's blade with combatives and and you know we steal from jujitsu, we steal from Muay Thai, we we, we kind of combine it all together. But it's the blade piece is heavily based on the Psyoc Kali family, you know, you know the Psyoc family, S A Y O C, um, also the Atienzas. Um, so if you look at Harley Elmore again up here in Wichita Falls, you know he's a Tuhan in Psyoc Kali. Um, I would tell you just out of the gate, the blade thing, most listeners, most people who've seen me on a TV show or whatever, they're like, oh, fucking, I'm not going to carry a blade, stab somebody. They're not really understanding the full concept of this. It's a tool just like anything else. Um, it complements the pistol and combatives a lot. And, I, and I'll explain that in a very simple way for the listener in a second. But the first thing I would say is uh, if we go, what's the closest steak restaurant to where we're sitting right now? Because obviously I don't know this place. Uh, is there an Outback? Yeah, there's an Outback right down the road. Yeah, right down off 45. If yeah. we go to Outback right now, guess what they're going to give us? A knife. Free. Yep. In fact, if they give you one and I pocket it and I tell the waitress she didn't give me one, she's going to give me another one. <laughs> that's that's fucking no fact shit. right yeah, there. Absolutely. I mean, um, it's a tool that's been around since the beginning of humankind, okay? Um so why would you want to use it? Well, if you look at the big scope of the GWAT, everywhere that the United States military has deployed post 9-11, and you could even, I mean, even post-World War II, the majority of the countries are blade cultures. Now, that's a big thing for a lot of people to wrap their mind around. Now, a lot of people would say, Afghanistan's a gun culture. There's guns everywhere. Well, <laughs> if you are a member of a certain group, there is. <laughs> If you're not a member of that group, it's going to be hard for you to get one or to maintain one. But you can get off a plane in Kandahar, walk sub 400 meters to a market, and buy a myriad of blades. You can do that in Africa. You can do that. Hey, listen, what about the United Kingdom? You want to go to England right now? Let me tell you what you're not going to carry in England when you land. You ain't carrying a gun. But listen, England has blade problems, right? Yeah, <laughs> because yep. that's all that's there. <laughs> It, it it to the point where most people need to understand honestly we are the only gun culture on this planet and i mean jesus christ i'm sitting in the fucking heart of it right now freaking yeah. texas right i mean i mean you can't swing a dead cat but everybody everybody here's got multiple guns like we can probably go in a parking lot and just open a car door there's a gun in there <laughs> you know it's texas we are the gun culture so just understanding that for a deploying force they need to understand blades they need to understand blades in the aspect of both using them and probably a little bit of counter-edge weapon. So that's where this all comes from. It just so happens that the Psyoc guys were very early on. They're like, hey, if one of our uh, you know, American guys has a rifle in a very tight-in environment, uh, pieing a door, going into it, and somebody takes that rifle offline, however they do it, they bum rush you, they grab it, they hit you, whatever, your answer is to draw a blade. If you think you're going to transition to your pistol, this is not going to happen. And, I mean, we've proven this time and time again. It's, it's, it's like that, that's the answer, right? So um, I, when I started that with Tom years ago, I mean, I was the only guy doing it. And it was like we got made fun of the world over. You go back and look at some of the old stuff online. Look, look, he's teaching people to stab people, you know, blah, 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 whatever. And it's like, well, now look at it. I mean, look. Who who doesn't make a blade, right? Now, it's still the 25-yard speed bull thing. It's like everybody's on the board because they know the power of it, right? Uh, in fact, one of the old Syoc Kali things is, you know, the power of the blade. That was, you know, the old man. That was one of his statements. Um, so I tell guys, look, here, here's the honesty. Hopefully you don't offend anybody with a statement. That's about to come out of my mouth. You should not learn blade stuff from a white man unless he's learned it from a Filipino. That's what I would tell people. And obviously the Sayak family and the Atienza family are, are Filipino. They, and they, they immigrated here not that long ago. I mean, it's not. That, that Filipino culture of 
of the blade is beyond most people's scope of understanding warfare. I mean, g go back and look at what General Douglas MacArthur said about the Filipino commandos in World War II and how they put a hurtin' on the Japanese, and they didn't have guns. The Japanese had guns. Filipinos had blades, and they still put a hurtin' on them. So super powerful thing. Um, here would be the best way for most people to, to wrap their mind around it. Pick me, um, give me a black belt in jiu-jitsu. Do you guys know any? I wouldn't be able to. All right, here you go. I'll name some. <laughs> All right, let's go with Luigi Mondelli. He's from America Top Team in Connecticut. He's a fifth-degree black belt. Um, at Bill Rapier at Amtec. But Bill's a black belt under Gustavo Machado. Let's add Gustavo Machado to that. He's a black belt. Uh, let's add BJ Penn, who is uh, a, kind of a friend of the tribe. Let's add uh, Frank Cucci. Um, there's five right there. There's five Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belts. Um, you know, some of those are under the Gracie family. Okay, so right now, let's just take Luigi, because because he's a friend. Um, fifth degree black belt. He's from Brazil, by the way. <laughs> Once again, I tell people like, yeah, I'm going to go learn jiu-jitsu from, from Kyle. I'm like, well, I mean, if you're going to learn it from me, you're going to hear me say that I have learned it from a Brazilian because they fucking invented it, dude. Okay. So if you go to Luigi, right, well, let's say Luigi's talent level right now, and let's just pick Ike here. So I'm going to give you, like through a magical device right now, everything Luigi Mondelli has done to be a fifth degree black belt, I'm going to put it in your body. His experiences of 30 plus years living in Brazil, training with people that we could spend an hour just naming, going back to Helio Gracie, lineage wise. You have that knowledge. It's in you. Whoever you fight, if they produce a blade, you're going to have a fucking problem. If they don't have a blade, you have no problem. All your black belt shit's going to work out just fine. Now think about that. Now think about that in different aspects, right? A female. A female law enforcement officer. I could give her all of Luigi's stuff. Like, she's got it, but she's still five foot two and weighs 90 pounds. So what's Christian going to do if he's a bad guy? He's just going to pick her up and throw her to the ground. That's what he's going to do. But if I give her a blade, <laughs> <laughs> things have changed dramatically. In fact, you could go even one more step and say, let's pick a 10-year-old boy, 12-year-old boy, a kid, you know, a boy that's not, he, you know, maturity hasn't there, the muscle's not there yet, the, the, the mind is definitely not, he's not a man yet. You give him a blade and show him very – he doesn't need to be a Tuhan in Sioc. He just needs to know kind of what we teach on a basic level. You got a problem, dude. Like it's a big – and it's a big problem. And it's a problem that when you look at counter-edge weapon, which in itself is <laughs> – talk about mindset. You notice we never say the word blade defense, which, by the way, a lot of people – how do I defend against a blade? And I'm like, well, first off, you don't. There is no defense. There's a counter, which by in itself is you're you're opening up Pandora's box of combatives that is so deep and so long that it it, it takes you years to get into this. Really, and by the way, the best counter edge weapon dude that I know is Harley Elmore. But like that is the power of the blade right there. It is a it is a very interesting thing. Um, and we're back. And we're back. I've said that twice now. You guys got to leave that in there. I've always wanted <laughs> <Yeah>. to do that. <laughs> I'll probably never listen to this. I'm not going to kid you because I can't stand the way I sound. <laughs> You're good, dude. You're good. We're, I, I, we appreciate you coming. But, like, going from, like, knives and stuff to, like, tomahawks. Like. The hawk, yeah. The hawk thing is a – so, again, way misunderstood. Um, you know, if it, depending on what, you know, bullshit book you read – they're like, oh, those guys are carrying that to scout people. I mean, <laughs> obviously, that is not the reason. So, uh, again, understand the history of the hawk, okay? Um, so, Winkler, Daniel Winkler, was the first one to make a hawk that would be a, um, you know, the one that, that most people recognize. That, if, if you look, you can ask Daniel Winkler. I mean, that was designed by a Sioc guy. Mm -hmm. It's actually called the Sioc R&D Hawk. Um, there's a guy by the name of Raphael Cayenne. 
um, who is a, another Tuhan in Sioc, he helped with that design. Um, so, so like most, when we see Hawks nowadays, like again, because you're in this age of, of social media, people see one, they're like, well, I'm going to go make one. They really don't have any idea what's going on with it. And what I mean by that is, is that the Sioc guys are the first guys to put the way the beard is on that Hawk, it, the the curvature of that, which is actually used for a specific purpose, not for actually, quote unquote, killing or it, it's made to hook people so they can't get away. Right. Um, the front spike, the rear spike. Those are all things that were never done until they did that. And you look at it now, um, Headhunter Blades, which is Harley's thing. You know, the Warhawk that he has, in my opinion, that's the best one made. It still has that classic head design that you found on the on the, the original Winkler Hawk from Sioc, but uh, that, that gentle curve that gives you a mechanical advantage. But um, the big use of those was that, you know, a, a breaching tool. I mean, that that was a big part of it. Like you could you could pop a hasp with it. Um, you could you could do some prying with that thing. Um, and again, you look at a weight type scenario where pretty much anybody in Afghanistan, it wouldn't matter if they were a, a JSOC guy or a freaking 82nd Airborne dude, if they can save some ounces here and there, you know. So if you know that your target set is in a certain area where the locking mechanisms for, for breaching are just not that good, you're not dealing with American type construction or whatever, well, why would you carry a fucking Halligan? Right. And, you know, if you don't need to. Yeah. I mean, and it might just be one job, but it's like, why would I carry a Halligan and a, and a, and a sledge, an eight pound sledge when I don't need to? So that was another big part of it. Now, obviously, they are used as a as a quote unquote secondary weapon. Um, a lot of guys would wear them in different places. Some guys would replace the pistol holster with a Hawk. Um, the Kydex sheaths that we typically make out of those you know, without having one here in front of us, like they're made to wear, they're, they're super safe, like uh, typically a bungee retention until we get semi close to maybe we might use it, that bungee comes off. A lot of guys would wear them on their plate carrier in the front in between magazines, but to draw it, you would actually have to pull up 90 degrees out and that's the only way it would come out of the, of the sheath. So uh, believe it or not, like a lot of that's not swinging though. The hawk, you know, holding it, uh, basically, I guess the listener may not be on video, but like gripping it high toward the head, uh, using it, you know, to punch or come back or come down with, with a slight strain. I mean, I, that's, uh, I'm giving you the 30-second the version of, of hawk usage. But, yeah. but as a tool, uh, one of the, you know, super lightweight, super thin, super strong, made correctly to do a bunch of di different functions. Uh, that, that's kind of the, the hawk thing. I saw... Some guys, you know, recently there's a book that came out that's like claiming certain things for that SOCOM guys did. I'm like, I've actually never heard of that. You know what I mean? Like, it's painfully obvious. It's kind of a a smear campaign, but um, that's all the Hawk is. I mean, yeah. Well, Kyle, dude, we we really appreciate you coming on the Absolutely. show, spending spending two hours with us this morning. Yeah, no problem. Man. Two two good episodes out of one. One shot. We really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. No, this, is, uh, this is great. Where can our listeners or our audience find you? Uh, just Google. I mean, <laughs> it's been, uh, I've been here since social media started, so there's more of me. Uh, I mean, obviously, my Instagram is, is the go, and through the Instagram, you can get to the website. Uh, I do a Facebook page, but it's just a, the whole Facebook thing is like a backup. You know, when I post on Instagram, it automatically goes there, so... Um, if you want to comment and stuff like that, do it on Instagram. I don't really pay attention to Facebook because it's, you know, Facebook is like a trash can. I mean, you just can't control the, the ads and all the, the, the bullshit, but Instagram's a little bit easier. And then uh, there's, I got a YouTube channel. Um, you know, the web the website's got some articles on it. All the shooting tests are on there. Um, so, so do some research on there if you want to. There's links to all the guys. Uh, I think most everybody here I've talked about is linked on there on my website. So, yeah, Instagram, website, Facebook, YouTube, it's all there. And we'll link it down in the comments and, and drop some cards on YouTube for your listeners and viewers to to get in touch with you, sign up for classes, see what's going on. For if you can. Tw yeah, if you can. <laughs> for 2024. For 2023, 2024 classes. We really appreciate it, dude. 
Yeah, I, well, I appreciate you guys having me. It was cool. I've never done this. Yeah, I'm still great. kind of listening to myself in my headset right now. It's weird. <laughs> it's just low enough that it doesn't. Yeah. Typically, it's not bad. No, it was good, man. Podcasts. I'm looking forward to it. Awesome. You guys send me a link and I'll repost or whatever. Oh, I really awesome. appreciate it. Yeah. I really, really appreciate it, dude. Thank you. Thanks.